Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rev Dehadal, and I'd like to welcome you all to Students Against Israeli Apartheid's lecture on the Palestinian Nakba. So the idea for this lecture came as a request from SIA members that Hamam Farah give an internal educational on the history of the ethnic cleansing of Palestine. This humanitarian crisis is often referred to as the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. But this is not a conflict between two equal parties over some disputed territory. But much like the civil rights movement, or the struggle, uh, the Algerian or Irish struggle against European colonialism, or the Tamil and Kurdish struggle for self-determination, or the struggle of blacks in South Africa against apartheid. This is a conflict between occupier and occupied, aggressor and victim. However, over the decades, the mainstream media has played a significant role in covering this unbalanced relationship, but not anymore. Thanks largely to the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement, BDS, to social media, and to the vibrant history of Palestine activism, the world is beginning to wake up and realize the struggle for justice, freedom, and equality in Palestine. But that doesn't mean that everyone knows about the history of this conflict. It's more likely that your community members decided to join SIA because of Israel's recent massacre in Gaza than it is because they learned about the Nakba, which is the root cause of this conflict. And so we felt it was important to not only give this lecture to SIA members, but also to the your community and to the public. It's only through our knowledge of the root causes can we truly understand uh, the struggle for equality between Israelis and Palestinians. As many of you know, SIA York is part of a growing global movement for boycott, divestment, and sanctions, or BDS. Our club was founded in January 2008 and has been a force for change on campus ever since. York University's mission statement cites a commitment to social justice, but we believe that the university has not fulfilled its commitment until it fully implements BDS. At York, this necessarily translates into divestment from arms manufacturing companies. Our divestment campaign doesn't only demand divestment from weapon companies that supply the Israeli army, but indeed all weapons companies. In the 2012-2013 year, after gathering 5,000 student signatures on a petition, SIA was successful in pushing the York Federation of Students to pass BPS. The Graduate Students Association and the TAs and Contract Faculty Union, QP3903, also passed BPS. In addition, after being sanctioned for protesting York's investments in weapons, we have also taken on freedom of expression on campus as part of our campaign. I will now read to you SIA's mission statement. We believe Israel is an apartheid state that resembles South African apartheid. Palestinian citizens of Israel are denied from controlling and developing over 90% of land because they are Palestinian. Palestinians expelled in 1948 and 1967 are denied the right to return to their homes and lands, despite the fact that anyone of Jewish background from anywhere in the world has the automatic right to become an Israeli citizen. Um, in the occupied West Bank in the Gaza Strip, Palestinians live under separate and discriminatory military law. The Canadian government provides extensive political and economic support to Israel. Canadian corporations profit from investments and joint operations with Israeli companies. Canadian universities invest in corporations involved in Israeli war crimes and maintain ties with Israeli uh, universities that are responsible for weapons research and land confiscation. We believe that justice will not be achieved without equal rights for everyone in the region, regardless of religion, ethnicity, or nationality. We understand Israeli apartheid as one element of a system of global apartheid. To this end, we stand in solidarity with all oppressed groups around the world, in particular, the indigenous people of North America. We oppose all forms of racism, sexism, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, homophobia, transphobia, ableism, and all other forms of oppression. Our demands are based upon a July 2005 call from over 170 Palestinian organizations in support of the global movement for boycott, divestment, and sanctions. BDS should be maintained until Israel meets its obligation to recognize the Palestinian people's inalienable right to self-determination and fully complies by international law by one, ending its occupation and colonization of all Arab lands, dismantling the wall, and freeing all Palestinian Arab political prisoners. Two, 
recognizing the fundamental rights of all Arab Palestinian citizens of Israel to full equality, and three, respecting, protecting, and promoting the rights of Palestinian refugees to return to their homes and properties as stipulated in UN General Assembly Resolution 194. Now I will introduce to you our speaker, Hamam Fair. Hamam is a um, York alumnus and a Palestinian activist based in Toronto. His family's resilience in Gaza doesn't only serve as a source of inspiration for him, but also all of us here at SIA. He is a member of the Coalition Against Israeli Apartheid, a founding member of Amnesty International at York, former coordinator of the Student Christian Movement at York, <coughs> former song director for the York Federation of Students, and a founding member of Students Against Israeli Apartheid at York University. Hamam was given a year-long trust pass notice by administration in 2013 because he exercised his right to freedom of expression by protesting York's investments in weapons. While he was banned, he spent much of his time researching York's decision-making structure, its policies, and its vision. And so when he came back to us in September, he brought back many of these valuable lessons that we then put into action. And the results are pretty obvious to anyone paying attention to the current events at York University. Our Why We Die Best campaign has been remarkable. So much so that we've been recently subject to a barrage of intimidation and harassment from those who support investments in weapons. But we will not be intimidated or silenced, and we'll continue our work for a better Europe, a Europe that fulfills its statement to social justice. And so finally, whew, it's my pleasure to welcome you, Hamar Barra. to this introductory lecture on the colonization and ethnic cleansing of Palestine. There is a plethora of historical records about the tragedy of Palestine. And what isn't commonly known is that in the 1980s, Israel declassified its military records of the events of 1948, including the orders given by Zionist leaders to remove thousands of Palestinians from their homes. The declassified military archives were like a treasure chest for a group of Israeli historians who became known as Israel's new historians because they were able to provide new information about Israeli history. But that information wasn't new to Palestinians. In fact, what these historians found in the military records largely confirmed and corroborated the accounts of Palestinian historians and Palestinian survivor testimony. One of these Israeli historians is Ilan Pape, who relied on the declassified archives and on Palestinian eyewitness testimony, and published his masterpiece book, The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine, in 2006. I have that book with me. Uh, yes. <laughs> Uh, so I'll just show you these three books I have. This is The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine by Ilan Pape, Israeli historian. This is a book called Israel, a Colonial Settler State by Jewish-French intellectual Maxime Rodinson. This is an old one. It was written in 1979, I believe. And this book here is called All That Remains. It's by Palestinian historian Walid Khalidi. This book is an encyclopedia, literally, an encyclopedia of 500 Palestinian cities, towns, and villages that were depopulated um, in 1948 by Zionist forces. And if you uh, it, uh, look, look, at, look into the pages, you'll see that each section uh, has the districts in Palestine, uh, each village and city and town, its map, uh, and details and statistical details uh, such as uh, how many people were living there, how many were expelled, the method of expulsion that took place, um, and what happened to them afterwards, and whether they even exist today or not, because Many of these villages were burned to the ground and bulldozed, or they were given over to uh, uh, European Jewish settlers. So although Ilan Pape became an anti-Zionist, the more he learned. Another new historian by the name of Benny Morris did not. This didn't mean that Morris denied the ethnic cleansing, as many Zionists are taught to, by the Israeli government 
and traditional Israeli historians. On the contrary, he acknowledged and reported the ethnic cleansing in his book, The Birth of the Palestinian Refugee Problem. But unlike Pape, he not only held on to his Zionist ideas, but he also refused to use Palestinian testimony, even though historians re rely on people's testimonies as standard practice. But all he needed was the Israeli military's own records, and he believed that Zionist forces should have continued to drive out Palestinians until they were all expelled, because according to him, it would have saved Israel from what Israeli officials refer to as the demographic time bomb, which I will get to later in this talk. The point here I'm trying to make is that even some Zionist historians have acknowledged the events of 1948. There is another book, which I don't have here with me, unfortunately. It's called uh, Blood and Religion by British journalist Jonathan Cook. This one really helped further my understanding of the situation because he, he had a framework, he used a framework of numbers, of population, a demographic framework. And there's a chapter in his book called The Battle for Numbers, which effectively explains the demographic motivations of political Zionism. So what I hope that you will understand from this talk is how much population and numbers means to the Israeli government. And, and that this whole conflict, if you will, is all about, all boils down to an issue of dem demography, an issue of numbers, where the Zionist movement's uh, motivation from then until today is the preservation of a Jewish majority state. And the word majority here is very important for us to understand. It's not necessarily a state of only Jews, as Benny Morris wanted, but a state where Jews are the majority and they are able to maintain that majority status. Why? Because Israel is a liberal democratic state. And if it's a liberal democratic state, it means that the power of the majority, the majority has the power of the vote. And that's how the Zionist movement uh, planned to ensure uh, a Jewish state in Palestine by uh, sustaining that majority of Jews at any and all costs, even if it meant the expulsion and taking away the rights of people who actually were the majority in 1947 and were reduced to a minority by 1949. In 1973, the French Jewish intellectual Maxime Rodinson wrote a short book called Israel, a Colonial Settler State, one of which I showed you. In the introduction, Peter Buck states that Rodinson traces the origins and mentality of Zionism to the conditions of 19th and 20th and early 20th century Europe, when capitalism went through a period of great expansion and empire building, which finally, finally led to the First World War unfurling the banner of a universal European civilizing mission, the European powers surged into the underdeveloped world, annexing colonial territories and mercilessly exploiting the subjugated peoples who were put to work on plantations and in mines to help in the looting of their own countries. But the Zionist nationalists, unlike, the Euro unlike other European colonialists, had to, have, had to create a social base as well as take over a national territory. According to the academic Bill Ashcroft, there is a distinction between occupation colonies where the purpose is holding territory and settler colonies where the invading Europeans or their descendants annihilated, displaced, and or marginalized the indigenous people to become a majority non-indigenous population. So having said that, we start our story in the 1800s. Jewish persecution in Europe, and we must acknowledge the long history of persecution and anti-Semitism in Europe. Has the European Jewish community thinking about Jewish liberation? Most thinkers advocated for Jewish resistance against oppression until Europe recognized and respected their rights. But a minority of intellectuals led by Austrian journalist Theodor Herzl advocated for Zionism. And Zionism's general definition 
means the national movement for the return of the Jewish people to their ancient homeland and the resumption of Jewish sovereignty in the land of Israel. Herzl linked the idea of Zionism to the idea of the nation state. So whereas Zionist intellectuals used to debate what, you know, so this, this definition of Zionism, it's brief, but we can also have debates about what that means. Maybe it's an inner struggle. Maybe it, uh, it, it, could, it could manifest in many ways. But Herzl, unlike other Zionists, he advocated for a physical uh, manifestation where Jews would actually be uh, moved from one region of the world to another uh, in order to establish a physical Jewish state. So under that thinking, Jews weren't defined merely as a religious group but as an ethnicity or an ethno-religious group. Herzl wrote the book Der Judenstaat, or The Jewish State, and he believed that the solution to anti-Semitism and the only way that Jews would be safe in the world is within a Jewish state. This became known as political Zionism. Although a few, a, a few options were considered for the location of that state, Palestine was decided upon because of its historical and biblical significance to the Jewish people. But as history has shown, a nationalism that is calling for the formation of a nation state by physically relocating its people from one geographical region of the world to another leads to failure and bloodshed. Herzl convened the first Zionist Congress in Basel, Switzerland in 1897 outlining the goal of establishing a Jewish home in Palestine. And here I quote Herzl. Were I to sum up the Basel Congress in a word, which I shall guard against pronouncing publicly, it would be this. At Basel, I founded the Jewish state. Herzl adopts colonialism as the process of establishing a Jewish state in Palestine. See, the use of colonial language and its normality as a, as a common terminology of civilized people of the time or civilized people, is what I'm trying to say, if you're catching on to that. <laughs> um, civilized people at the time was common knowledge, was common use. So Herzl, for example, Herzl lobbied the Ottoman Empire, or the Turkish Empire of the time, that ruled over the Middle East. And here I quote him again, and he told the Ottoman Emperor, if you allow us to go into Palestine, we shall serve as the outpost of civilization against barbarism. And Herzl wrote, we must expropriate gently the private property on the state assigned to us. We shall try to force the penniless population across the border by denying it employment. Both the process of expropriation and the removal of the poor must be carried out discreetly and circumspectly. So you can see the European classic 19th century European colonial language uh, being utilized by the Zionist movement and the links the Zionist movement had built with uh, uh, colonial powers, first the Ottomans and then the British, as I will get to shortly. It is said that Herzl's colleague, Max Nordau, sent two rabbis to Palestine to investigate the prospects of a Jewish state there. They sent a report back to, Her to Herzl, which concluded that the bride is beautiful but she is married to another man, i.e. Palestine was already inhabited. Nevertheless, Zionists at the time popularized the idea of Palestine as a land without a people for a people without a land, and this became a popular quote. Now we shift to Palestine. In the 1800s, Palestine was a province of the decaying Ottoman Empire. But Palestinians were a community of Muslims, Christians, and Mizrahi Jews. Indeed, Jews who considered themselves Palestinian Arabs. And they were living together in harmony, despite the oppression of the Ottoman Empire. And their history went back thousands of years to the ancient times of the land of Canaan. In the 1800s, however, European Jewish settlements began, 
and was sponsored by French aristocrat Baron Edmond de Rothschild, who bought plots of land from wealthy Arab landowners in order to realize that settlement. In 1908, the Jewish agency was established by the Zionist organization to take over from Rothschild and facilitate European Jewish settlements in Palestine. The Jewish National Fund, or JNF, was also set up to acquire land in Palestine. The JNF has a land and afforestation department, which by some accounts used to be called the Colonization Department, but changed its name to Land and Afforestation Department when colonization became a bad word. The JNF is still active today, building parks over demolished Palestinian villages. Many of its leaders are also in the Israeli government's land, Israel Lands Authority. And despite its charter stating that land can only be sold to Jews, it is shamefully, it shamefully has charitable status here in Canada. And if anybody is interested in joining Palestine Solidarity Activism after this lecture, there is a campaign uh, trying to stop, to, to remove the JNF from having charitable status in Canada. And you can ask me about that. Um, I can connect you with people in Toronto uh, that are working on it. In 1917, the Balfour Declaration takes place. And the Balfour Declaration is when the Foreign Secretary of Britain, Lord Arthur Balfour, uh, writes a letter to the Zionist movement uh, saying that His Majesty's government views with favor the establishment of a national home for the Jewish people in Palestine. And this was an official endorsement by the British Empire to the Zionist movement. The British thought that they could control the Middle East by establishing a European outpost, as Herzl was saying to the Ottoman Emperor prior to that. The British took, on, took that on. They accepted Herzl's proposal, and uh, they, they thought that it would be beneficial for their empire if they had a European outpost smack in the middle of the Middle East. So then waves of Jewish immigration began, and it intensified during the Nazi Holocaust, in which at least six million Jews were murdered by Hitler's regime. As a result of the Holocaust, Zionism became, uh, gained in popularity and among the majority of Jews in Europe. They were now convinced that they had no place in Europe, that assimilation with non-Jews had failed, and that they should now leave to Palestine which was being promoted by the Zionists as a paradise in the desert, awaiting its people to come home. Making the desert bloom was the phrase that was used. It was a common phrase used to describe the way that Jewish colonists were building their homes and farms in Palestine, which was supposedly empty, arid desert, waiting for a hard-working people to make it bloom. Never mind that Palestinians and industries such as soap and orange industries. They had high standards of education and railway st a railway station and even a wealthy middle class. In 1936 to 1939, the Palestinians revolt against the British and the Balfour Declaration. The British crush this revolt. Palestinian leaders are exiled. The population is defeated. Sometimes Palestinians refer, refer to the 1936 revolt as the very first intifada. And crushing that revolt weakens the Palestinian people to such an extent that this set the stage for their defenselessness during the Nakba in 1948. The British eventually gave up. They gave responsibility of Palestine over to the United Nations which was newly formed. The United Nations passed Resolution 181. Resolution 181 is what we refer to as the Partition Plan. And the Partition Plan was a proposal by the UN that said that about 60% of Palestine would go to a Jewish state and about 40% would go to a Palestinian state. Although, by 1947, and this is important, by 1947, the Jewish agency was not able to acquire 
uh, a significant amount of land through buying, through purchase. They were only able to acquire 5 to 7% of the land. 5 to 7%. Yet the UN proposed about 60% of Palestine should be given to the Zionist movement for a Jewish state. The Jewish uh, agency accepts this proposal. However, David Ben-Gurion has a problem. And David Ben-Gurion is the leader of the Jewish agency at the time, who became Israel's first uh, prime minister. David Ben-Gurion has a dilemma. The population of, 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 of uh, the population inside what was to be, to become a Jewish state, was roughly equal in number between Jews and Palestinians. About 50-50. And this was a problem. Because if the population is almost, is about 50-50, how are you going to have a Jewish state? How can you declare a Jewish state over an area where almost half your population is not Jewish and then call yourself democratic? This was a reality that David Ben-Gurion was, con was confronted with that today many Zionists, I assure you, don't even know about this, about this little fact. If the Palestinians had accepted the partition plan, Israel wouldn't even exist. You know, we're constantly being accused of not of rejecting the plan back in 1947. But if we had accepted it, Israel wouldn't even exist because Israel would have been established on an area where half the population was Palestinian. You couldn't have a Jewish majority. It wasn't going to happen. And David Ben-Gurion knew that. And so Zionist leaders were discussing the idea of what they called compulsory transfer, which was a euphemism for ethnic cleansing. In 1940, Joseph Weitz of the JNF stated, Between ourselves, it must be clear that there is no room for both peoples together in this country. We shall not achieve our goal of being an independent people without the Arabs in this small with the Arabs in this small country. The only solution is Palestine, without the Arabs. And there is no other way but to transfer the Arabs from here to the neighboring countries. To transfer all of them. Not one village, not one tribe should be left. And indeed, in 1947, David Ben-Gurion began to put this plan into motion. And the most intense part of this plan was called Plan D, or Plan Dalit. Which, which, or, which orders, direct orders for ethnic cleansing were given to Zionist militia. Uh, there was an operation called Operation Broom. Operation Broom, the purpose was to sweep away the villages of, uh, of Palestinians. And so, in 1947, the Haganah blows up two villages. And the way they used to do it, um, the way they also did things, was that they would roll a barrel, they would set a barrel on fire and roll it down a hill, and the barrel would roll into a Palestinian village. People would come out to put out the fire in a frenzy, and they would be sniped by Haganah snipers from the hills. Other methods they used was that they would bring, they actually did this, they brought loudspeakers with, uh, with sounds of screams into the front of the village to scare people. And they would announce, you need to leave now before we come and, and kick you out. You need to leave. Things got more intense as 1948 uh, arrived. In April 1948, the village of Der Yassin was massacred by the Urgun gang, Urgun and Stern gangs. About a hundred people, men, women, and children, were killed. 
including pregnant women. This is documented. Uh, I should give a trigger warning. There's, we're going to talk about violence, graphic violence. Uh, pregnant women were bayoneted. I don't know if everybody knows what that means, but uh, World War I, the guns had knives coming out of them. They are bayonets, that's what they were called. And you would stick it in the person's stomach and do this kind of movement to kill them. And uh, the Urgun utilized this to kill pregnant women in the village of Deryasin. This massacre scared a lot of people. The media, the, the Palestinian media was in a frenzy about it. A lot of people were scared. The, the story uh, was exaggerated. Uh, people, uh, there were a lot of fears that came out of it. And then people started to flee their homes because of fear. And the Urgun even acknowledged that this was part of the plan. They wanted to do something that would scare the Palestinians into leaving. And this is what they did. Um, throughout this year, the Haganah took, gave orders also to evacuate the city of Lid and the city of Ramlid. The commander that was given these orders was Yitzhak Rabin, who later signed the peace process with the Palestinians in 1993. These cities, and I do mean they were cities, 30,000 people where there was their population. I think one was 20,000, one was 30,000. They were evacuated by military order. Its people were death marched across the border. Three days they had to march. Some died of thirst. Others had to drink their own urine to survive. The elderly were shot. The disabled were shot. And there were several massacres that are documented that occurred throughout that year as well. Several other massacres. In, in May 1948, David Ben-Gurion declares the, state of, the establishment of the State of Israel. 200,000 Palestinians had been expelled. He felt that this was the time where, where uh, the Jewish agency had finally achieved its goal of forcing a Jewish majority to exist in Palestine. Finally, they were a majority. He didn't feel that he needed to expel all Palestinians. That's why we have Palestinians who are citizens of Israel today. Those are the ones who had remained, who were not expelled. But they are a minority today. And he had achieved his goal of forcing, by blood, by massacre, a Jewish uh, majority in Palestine. And then he declared the, state, the establishment of the State of Israel. This is, as the, the Zionist narrative then tells us, that five Arab armies attacked the newly formed uh, Jewish state with the intent of destroying it. Um, the reality is that these Arab armies intervened because of two things. One, because uh, 200,000 Palestinians had already been expelled and the Arab population in the rest of the Middle East, they were protesting in the streets, uh, pressuring their government to do something about it before uh, it gets worse. The second reason they intervened uh, the second reason was that Israel was established not on about 60% that the UN had suggested, but 78% of Palestine. Therefore, Israel violated the UN resolution that proposed to create it. It violated Resolution 181 by establishing itself on more land than the resolution had, said, has, had proposed. 
78% of Palestine had just become the state of Israel. So the Arab armies finally intervened. They were too late. Not only were they too late, but they were ill-equipped. They had Ottoman, old Ottoman guns, while the Haganah was trained by the British Empire. They had updated uh, British guns that were used in World War II. The mass expulsion. It resulted in 700, 750,000 Palestinians were expelled uh, from their homes. Expulsion isn't necessarily, isn't necessarily, you know, telling someone to leave at gunpoint. Expulsion is also denying somebody their right to return. So there's this debate going on in Israel over how many people were expelled, um, over uh, what methods were used, you know, whether people, you know, fled out of fear, whether they were told by Arab leaders to leave their homes, um, or whether they were massacred. The point is, at the end of the day, they were all expelled because expulsion is denying their right to return. After a war, people have the right to return. This is, uh, this is acknowledged by the United Nations. And when there's a war that happens, any war, what usually happens is that people will return. Civilians who flee have the right and they return home after the war. Palestinians have been denied this right to return until today. And precisely because of the battle for numbers. It was the only way they could, uh, the Zionist movement could ensure a Jewish state, a Jewish majority state, I should say. We refer to the sequence of events as Al Nakba. Al Nakba means the, the catastrophe. The Palestinian catastrophe. This is our tragedy. The Palestinian catastrophe, the Nakba, belongs on the list of denied tragedies in the world such as the Holocaust. There are Holocaust deniers out there, we know that. And there are also people who deny the Nakba. Most Zionists deny the Nakba. They don't acknowledge that this happened. They will say Arab leaders told the Palestinians to leave so, so that they can come in and, and, and destroy the Jewish state and then the Palestinians could come back. This is the narrative. It's ridiculous. It's, it's like the Pied Piper of Hamelin. You know, they say leave and everybody gets up and, and just leaves out of hatred for the Jews. This is the narrative. Thankfully, uh, there are uh, Israelis who are acknowledging the reality of what happened. But the extent of it is still, is still a big issue. And um, I, I commend the Israeli organization called Zohrot. Zofrot means remembering in Hebrew. It's a small organization, but it does great work in raising awareness to the Israeli public about the Nakba. They take people on tours in Israel to former Palestinian villages and show them all that remains. The Armenian Genocide, I just wanted to add, is another denied tragedy that we should recognize. The identity of the Kurds. Another issue we should we should pay attention to and recognize. The genocide of the Tamil people by the Sri Lankan state. We need to be consistent. Not just recognize one tragedy and deny the other. The absentee property law says that all those who weren't present during uh, 1948, all those who left, now their property is state property. It's under the control of the state. These were homes. Some families, Palestinian families, left pots <coughs> with food still on the stove. They thought they were coming back soon. There were children's toys still on the floor. There were families who lost uh, family members along the way and never were never reunited, never found them again. In Haifa, one more thing about this, in Haifa, Haifa has a port. People were uh, shot at until they ran to the beach and got on boats and left. This is important because today Palestinians are accused of wanting to drive Jews into the sea. 
Palestinians had already been driven into the sea. In 1967, there is another war between Egypt, Syria, and Jordan. Israel, by the end of the war, it only lasts six days, Israel takes over the rest of Palestine. It takes Gaza from Egypt and the West Bank from Jordan. Because after the Nakba, Jordan took the West Bank, controlled it, and Egypt took Gaza and controlled it. And the West Bank and Gaza and East Jerusalem, uh, those, are tw those make up 22% of Palestine. So Israel was established on 78%. The remaining 22% was West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem. And those were controlled by Egypt and Jordan. And in 1967, following that war, Israel took the rest. They, uh, they took over the West Bank, they took over Gaza, they took East Jerusalem. Now they had all of Palestine under Israeli control. However, and this is important, Israel didn't annex those territories. And annex means to make it part of, part of it, part of the country, officially part of the country, and impose, and impose civilian law. No. And there is a reason why it didn't annex those territories. A very important reason that I think is usually missed. And again, the answer is that it goes back to the demographic issue, to the battle for numbers. If they had taken, if they had annexed those territories, they would have had to give citizenship, Israeli citizenship and civil rights to the Palestinians living there. But they couldn't, because then they would have a problem with the numbers and the, the Jewish majority would be threatened again. So instead, instead of doing that, they imposed military law in order to build Jewish settlements in the West Bank and Gaza. They expanded into the West Bank and Gaza by building uh, settlements, Jewish settlements, and these settlements are illegal under international law. Article 49 of the Geneva Convention, which Israel signed, says that an occupying power cannot transfer parts of its population into the territory it occupies. Yet Israel is still doing that, and it's a major issue today, as we know. Uh, settlements are being, illegal settlements are being built into the West Bank today. Um, Palestinian land is being expropriated in the West Bank, in the occupied territories, it was being expropriated. However, Palestinians weren't given rights, they weren't given Israeli citizenship, they had no say in anything. And life under military rule was characterized by land expropriation, by settlements, by restrictions on movement. Military checkpoints are set up to control freedom of movement. There were different road systems that were uh, established for settlers and Palestinians. Sept uh, Israeli settlers drive on their own roads and Palestinians drive on their own roads. Uh, Palestinian cars have different license plate colors than Israeli cars. Palestinians have to have an ID that they have to show at, at the military checkpoints where they are routinely searched. Palestinians have to wake up at 3 in the morning, 4 in the morning, just to make it to work because what, what is a, a trip that would take 10 minutes to get to work, now because of the checkpoints, takes uh, 4 hours. And this was done for the protection of the settlers, to protect them. Because obviously, when you expropriate somebody's land, somebody's going to be angry about it. And, and so they had to provide security. So they would build the settlements and then surround them with the Israeli army in order to protect them. And Palestinian communities would be policed uh, by the Israeli army. And this reality went on until, well, still going on today. But in 1987, the Palestinians in the occupied territories finally revolted. They rose up against the Israeli army in what we call the first intifada. The intifada means uprising. And that was the first Palestinian uprising against the military occupation of, of the West Bank and Gaza and East Jerusalem. They would sometimes confront tanks in the street with stones. And this was bad for Israel's image in the media. The child in front of the tank. It made them look bad. And they, they, they had to come up with a solution to quell the uprising.
There is another reason why uh, they wanted to find a solution. And this is a, a, a reason that's often overlooked. In 1991, I think, somewhere around that time, the chief Israeli demographer who, takes the who looks at the population numbers freaks out. He goes to Yitzhak Rabin, the prime minister of Israel at the time, and he says, we have a problem. Uh, the numbers, the population of Palestinians is growing fast. And I project in 20 years, they're going to outnumber Jews. There will be more Palestinians under Israeli control in, in the West Bank, Gaza, East Jerusalem, and in Israel proper. There will be more Palestinians in the whole territory under Israeli control than Jews. This was a problem because people by this time were pissed off at apartheid South Africa. The apartheid regime in South Africa was collapsing. It was being isolated by boycott, divestment, and sanctions. People were boycotting it. Ordinary people like, like you and me. I don't know if you know, but York University divested from South Africa in 1985. And this was another reason why Yitzhak Rabin finally signed the peace process, uh, the Oslo Accords, as we know them. In 1993, the PLO and the Israeli government signed the peace process. And they, they began a process which it was understood that by five years, there would be two states. Uh, there would be Israel, and Palestinians would establish their state in the occupied territories. The West Bank, Gaza, and Israel would be the capital of the Palestinian state. The biggest problem was that throughout the 90s, it became apparent that what Israel was trying to do throughout the peace process was to take the most amount of land from the West Bank with the least amount of Palestinians. They would expand settlements and expropriate the land, and then they would come to the negotiating table and say, well, this is our portion. What do you want? There is a, a concept that is used by uh, some Palestinian uh, activists today and journalists called the pizza analogy. Now, the pizza analogy is very simple. The pizza analogy is you and me are negotiating over a pizza who gets how many slices. But while we're negotiating, I'm eating from the pizza. So this, this has been, to put it in a nutshell, very briefly, this has been Israel's behavior during the peace process. And this is why the main reason why the peace process collapsed. And today it's still eating from the pizza. It's still building settlements in, in, in defiance of international law and the United States itself. The U.S. doesn't even recognize Israel's uh, uh, control of East Jerusalem. I'm not going to go into any detail about Israel's attacks on Gaza. That's for another talk. Um, but we've seen what's been happening recently. Operation Cast Lead, 1,400 Palestinians were killed. Operation Protective Edge, over the summer, 2,200 Palestinians were killed. Hundreds of thousands of homes, uh, pe uh, people expelled and, and tens of thousands of homes demolished. We've seen the images. It's despicable. Uh, these are people living in ghettos, people in refugee camps. In fact, I should emphasize that Gaza, 80% of Gazans are not from Gaza. I am. I, I, I belong to that 20% that are from Gaza going back a thousand years. But 80% of Palestinians in Gaza are not from Gaza. They're refugees. They used to live in Israel. They were kicked out in 1948 in the Nakba. And now they're still in refugee camps languishing in Gaza. These are the ones who are fighting. They want to go back home. They're literally, literally, they were concentrated, just moved, pushed out of Israel and concentrated in this piece of land, Gaza, the most densely populated area in the world. And that's why it's the most densely populated, because the people don't earn from there. The situation today is that Israel and the West Bank have been integrated because of the Israeli settlements. 
It's hard to make a distinction. It's hard to separate them. Separating the West Bank from Israel is difficult. Settlements are still being built. East Jerusalem is not to be divided. This is an Israeli position by all Zionist political parties. 500,000 settlers uh, live in the illegal settlements in the West Bank and East Jerusalem, and they threaten war if the Israeli government tries to remove them. They threaten a civil war. Out of this reality, out of the failure of the peace process, the failure of, uh, of Palestinian, uh, of the world, the failure of the world to do something, to fix the situation, the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement was born. BDS attempts to do what was done to South Africa, where ordinary people like you and me, anywhere in the world, but especially here, can uh, participate and take action by boycotting, divesting, and uh, by pressuring our governments to sanction Israel. Now, of course, it's, much, it's a much harder job with Israel because of how much support Israel has with the government here, especially in Canada, the Canadian government. Harper is extremely supportive of Israel, more than Israel itself. <laughs> uh, but because of the failure, the failure of world powers to hold Israel accountable for its violations of international law, it is our responsibility to take up the cause of BDS. And Palestinians, this, and this is important, unlike other places in the world, Palestinians, specifically Palestinians, have called on the world to impose BDS. So finally, in the absence of creating a viable Palestinian state, in the absence of a workable two-stage solution, Israel has three choices. One, it could try ethnic cleansing, as it did before. There could be a second Nakba, where it would expel the Palestinians again, in, in mass numbers. And it's important to note that it, it does that today, but on a much uh, smaller scale than the Nakba. So people in the West Bank, regularly have Israeli soldiers coming up to their homes, knocking on their doors at 4 in the morning, being like, you have 15 minutes to get your children, get your belongings, get out of here. So your property just became state property. This happens regularly. That's how they confiscate your home for settlement construction. But one thing Israel can do is expel everybody. I don't, this is a very, I mean, the world is now, because thankfully, because of BDS, the world would, uh, I would probably extremely disapprove of Israel doing that, but who knows, we just saw what they did in Gaza. The second thing Israel could do is maintain the status quo and continue with building settlements, but it faces a growing international movement, uh, such as ourselves, condemning it and increased BDS pressure, and the world will definitely see Israel as an apartheid state because of this. And the third thing that Israel can do is give equal rights for everybody. Give Palestinians their rights. <coughs> um, give them Israeli citizenship. Integrate the territories. Uh, have civil rights. Give them civil rights. Uh, and that's going to be up to Palestinians and Israelis to, to really push uh, for that to happen. Uh, the Palestinian Liberation Movement has a lot of thinking to do uh, going forward, whether it wants to continue to pressure for an independent Palestinian state or whether it wants to take up the one-state solution where simply, you know, we call for the right to vote uh, in the Israeli parliament. Uh, and, 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 and people aren't, aren't strangers to that, uh, to that demand. As, you know, just like in South Africa and in the civil rights movement, people wanted you know, the right to vote. Um, and this could be something that may uh, end up taking place going forward in the near future. <clears throat> so to end up, I would just like to to say a quote from the great Palestinian intellectual Edward Said, who left us in 2003. He said, I have spent a great deal of my life during the 35 years advocating the rights of the Palestinian people to national self-determination. But I have always tried to do that with full attention paid to the reality of the Jewish people and what they suffered by way, by way of persecution and genocide. The paramount thing is that the struggle for equality in Palestine-Israel 
should be directed toward a humane goal, that is, coexistence, and not further suppression and denial. <laughs>